Good morning, everybody. How's the technology this morning? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So Monday, Monday, November 30th, last day of November and the last lecture, right? Our last lecture in this, sem this semester. So Wednesday we have our test, test three. And then Friday we'll have a um, review session for the final. Review session for the final. And um, just to, I know you may have lots of questions already. <clears throat> so <clears throat> regarding the final, I'll just tell you some brief, some uh, really basic, give you some really basic information, but if you have more specific questions, you can email me or just ask me on Friday. So we'll have uh, 60 questions on, on the final, 60 questions for two, two hours. And um, don't forget that the final, if you do well, the grade in the final will replace the grade of your worst exam. If you didn't miss one, if you if you did miss one of the exams during the semester, then that's the exam that will be replaced. And if you did not miss, then we'll take your lowest lowest scoring exam and replace that. So in principle, um, if you've been doing homework and uh, did poorly only on one of the tests, so you you know the, you you haven't you're really starting from a very good position to, um, to do well in this class. But um, keep in mind, you really have to study hard for the final and study hard for this third test. Now for the third test, I sent you the pages from the textbook that, um, that I used to uh, make the test. All right, and so the test will be on Wednesday. And um, any general questions at this point? Yeah, I'll do a quick one for the final. Uh -huh. um, now, does that work reversibly? Like, uh, let's say, you know, your final is lower than your worst exam. Could, would those switch? Would uh, your lowest exam then supplement for your final? You want to use one of your exams instead of the final? No, I was just wondering if it works uh, in both both ways. No, I. But to be honest with you, this is the first time I ever heard of that. But um, no, I don't think so. All right, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, well, the final. The only difference is that the final is comprehensive. But the type of questions on the final are very similar or even a little easier than, than the questions you get during the semester. So I realize that it's a comprehensive exam. So there's a bit of more studying goes into it. On the other hand, I, I mentioned to you guys that uh, things are, biology is very conservative. There's things there are same principles, same uh, ideas that uh, you see in, in some chapters, you see them come up in different chapters as well. So it looks like it's, um, it looks like the final is difficult because it's so comprehensive. On the other hand, it's like same ideas, same principles, you see them over and over. And uh, it's actually, it's easier to study to study for the final than to study for each individual exam. All right, anything else? Excuse All right, so, yeah. Um, so like, just like kind of thinking back like throughout your um, lectures, like um, 
like you mentioned like some research in there. I remember like you said like orphans going is something that we need to know. Is there anything else like research wise that we need to know for the exams besides the paper? Well, things that, that were discussed during the um, lectures. Yeah, so um, I do expect that I don't want to lose that material, don't want to lose that time. So obviously things that we discussed, um, I, you know, I justify myself in putting those, in putting that information on the test. So um, um, you, sh you should, uh, <clears throat> obviously when we discuss these things, I assume you were taking notes. If not, there's still, um, all each lecture is recorded. So you can still uh, have a marathon uh listening session for um all the lectures if you want right so so well what do you mean by research you know everything is research right so everything we talk about in this class is has been a, has been discovered through research right so sometimes i just tell you things from current research because uh, a lot of things, things in a textbook are um, come comes come from research that has been done over the last hundred years, right? But oftentimes I tell you things that are being done right now as we speak, so they haven't made they haven't made their way yet into the textbooks, and so yes, so I I want you to know that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we just uh, uh, have a, a little more material from chapter 12. I took out quite a few slides. Uh, again, this last chapter is, uh, as I mentioned to you, it's primarily biology, not so much related to, to biochemistry. Um, it but it's you know there's there's a um, it's very hard nowadays to uh, to draw a line between different fields, right? Everything um, becomes really mixed, and lots of collaborations between scientists and lots of um, discoveries discoveries that are made by teams of scientists working in different areas, who who combine their areas of expertise. And so it's a little bit biology, a little bit of biology will not hurt us. And so that's why there is this chapter 12. On the other hand, I don't want to overdo it. So I took out quite a few slides that uh, I think just going to be repetitive to what, what you, uh, to what you've already seen. So, um, so, origin, so the original package of slides that I uploaded um before we started chapter 12 uh, uh i will only i will not cover all of them and you will see that today um okay so let's let me go to share screen share screen on the other hand it would be nice to see how our ner um, nerve signal transmitted right we talked about last time we talked about Uh, how vision is perceived, right? So remember vision and olfaction. Remember this slide, right? So this uh, GPCR type signaling involved in vision. So today we will talk about enzyme linked membrane receptors. So, um, so these are um, will be basically enzymes, which are linked to the receptors on the membrane. Uh, so it's a different type of signal uh, transduction across the cell membrane. So there will be an extracellular ligand binding domain and an intracellular catalytic domain. And uh, so the most common catalytic domains are those that have tyrosine kinase activity. So, um, 
keep in mind that uh, uh, we have seen as before, right? So if you have tyrosine, so by this point, I would imagine that you know the structures of all amino acids, all right? Structures of all amino acids and phosphorylation is a really introduces a big change onto amino acids. Minus, minus. Right? So what we have is um, uh, if this is tyrosine, right? So be, uh, when in a unphosphorylated state, we just simply have a hydroxyl group. In a phosphorylated state, we have um, a phosphate attached to it. And uh, so this will be a receptor tyrosine kinase, right? And so uh, there's a tremendous change on the protein. And so there we add in two charges, right? We add in two charges. And so the properties will change on the protein. And so different kinds of proteins can bind to this site. So we will see that uh, the proteins that bind to phosphotyrosines are those that have specific domains, such as SH2. So we'll see that a little later. So this is uh, how the uh, these uh, enzyme linked membrane receptors work primarily, right? So they perceive a ligand on the outer side and they will phosphorylate either themselves or some other proteins and introduce phosphate residue. So if it's to itself, then we call this autophosphorylation, right? And um, It can also be phosphorylation of other proteins which are uh, nearby, which are, for example, bound to the receptor or just happen to be in the membrane, linked, in, uh, anchored in the membrane and are, and, and are found in the immediate vicinity of the, of the receptor tyrosine kinase. Now, some catalytic domains have guanylyl cyclase activity. So this is GTP will be converted to cyclic GMP. So uh, we've seen that already before, right? With the adenosine monophosphate. And so here you can have guanosine monophosphate. Guanosine monophosphate, <coughs> uh, which is actually um, a second messenger. So we talked about Hormones, and we talked about second messengers, are those molecules which transmit the signal into the cell. Okay, so as far as the receptor guanyl cyclases, we're gonna spend very little time here, but it's very useful to mention those. So, uh, so remember the way these work, you would have a, um, you would have a ribose. like so. Maybe I don't need to draw all the hydroxy groups, but um, let's say this is G, all right? This is G. And so you will have uh, three phosphates. So it's um, guanosine triphosphate right? Guanosine triphosphate, like so. And the enzyme, the enzyme receptor guanyl cyclase GC, GC is guanyl cyclase. So GC will grab this lone pair on a three prime hydroxyl, this will attack the phosphate at this position. 
and kick out the pyrophosphate as the leaving group. And you will have the cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP. Guanosine. Oxygen. Oxygen. And the phosphate here. Like so. So this is cyclic. Guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP. And so this will be a second messenger. Second messenger. And so, so this system is utilized for many different uh, biological functions. Again, nature is very conservative. Cyclic GMP occurs in many different tissues, performing different <coughs> functions. So for example, it's involved in, um, here it's involved in blood pressure regulation. So ANF is atrium nitriuretic factor. Uh, uh, you don't really need um, full, um, uh, full name for it, but uh, it's important to realize that uh, uh, the function. So atrium natriuretic factor, which is uh, produced by the atrium in the heart, right? So when the, when the blood pressure is very high, the heart actually feels that, right? The heart, the heart wall, the muscle feels that and starts and has it has the ability to produce uh, these uh, um, peptides, ANFs, which then travel to the kidney, travel to the kidney, binds to the uh, this receptor guanidyl cyclases, okay? And once it's bound, so oftentimes what happens is, um, there's some kind of dimerization process happening, right? So for example, uh, so guanidyl cyclase by itself is monomeric, but there is, but once the um, ligand arrives, it can kind of kind of glue the two receptors each other, uh, next, uh, glue them together. And then uh, that results in the catalytic activity. And so uh, once they glue together, then the intracellular catalytic part. So here will be um, transport, tran, tran, um, catalyzing the reaction of GTP, right? So this is GTP. To cyclic GMP. And uh, so, and what happens here, once the cyclic GMP is produced, uh, it's a second messenger it then a then, uh, cascade of events um, results in the, in the uh, release of sodium in the, in the urine, basically removal, removal of sodium from the blood. And what happens if the, if the sodium is removed from the blood when you uh, basically lose the sodium content in the blood? What happens to the blood pressure? water follows and it drops yeah so um so we've seen this over and over right when the salt when the salts are moved around water usually follows and as, as water follows the um the pressure follows as well so so here uh we're gonna uh, lose some of the um blood basically blood volume will, will, will decrease as the blood volume decreases, blood pressure drops. And that is one of the main reg regulation mechanisms for blood pressure. And uh, so for example, this one, guanylene, guanylene and, and the toxin receptors, very similar mechanism operating only, only in the gastrointestinal tract, in the um, 
endothelial cells in the intestines. Uh, so here again, um, uh, chloride is expelled from the from the blood into the um, gastrointestinal lumen, right? Gastrointestinal lumen, and if that happens, so so now imagine that uh, uh, you have chloride from the blood into the into the intestines. What's the physiological response? What's the physiological? What's the symptom of that? What what uh, will happen to you if if that happens? If your chloride moves from the blood into the GI tract and water follows and would you urine more? You do what? Would you like urinate more? No, it's going to be in the in the intestinal in the gastrointestinal tract. So you have diarrhea basically. Right, so we have diarrhea, and uh, so the interesting thing is it's also there are, um, you can, um, so these receptors for guanilin, uh, there are also receptors for endotoxins, for example, for various bacteria, for example, for E. coli, right? So you can have an E. coli poisoning, or you know that there are different strains of E. coli, right? There are different strains of that, which are sometimes when you drink tap water, um, you, you can be used to different kinds of strains. So you can drink it at home and you have no effect, but then you travel to different part of the world or different city, even in the same state and drink tap water there and you may have diarrhea. And so that's due to the fact that uh, the, um, the endotoxins in different strains of E. coli are different and they can, that can actually um, affect you in a different way. And so the culprit is the, the production of this cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP due to the endotoxins produced by bacteria. Okay, we'll skip that. This is a totally different topic. Soluble and nit nitric oxide activated guanylocyclase. So we'll skip that for now. So receptor tyrosine kinases. Now there are lots of them, lots of them, and many of them have become really famous. In the drug discovery community, <clears throat> specifically in, in uh, among scientists who develop anti-cancer drugs. So, so all of these are receptors which have some kind of ligands coming from the outside, some kind of uh, growth factors, for example, or insulin. So you can see here, so this is insulin receptor, INSR. It's a dimer. It's a dimer. There is uh, two alpha subunits, four beta subunits, and two and, and two uh, so now this is outside right and this will be inside two enzyme related domains now um, veg f we talked about that last time anybody remember what veg f stands for r is a receptor v e g f No? So this is vascular endothelial growth factor. So remember, this is the receptor which is responsible for growth of blood vessels. And remember, I was telling you that uh, it's an important receptor to block if you want to block the, gr the growth of tumors, for example, right? So, uh, so the tumors will not be able to grow their own blood vessels and supply themselves with oxygen and nutrients. Now there are other types of um, um, receptor tyrosine kinases. So this one is platelet-derived 
growth factor receptor. Now, I don't want you to know the, uh, to memorize this at this point, but if this rings, you know, if you hear it once here, hear it somewhere else again, and you will know eventually uh, that these are important growth factor receptors for cells of different kinds. Uh, and to perceive them as a, the cells will use these to perceive different signals. Now, this is epidermal, epidermal growth factor receptor, fibroblast growth factor receptor. Now, with this one, I'm not sure what that is. So, um, all of these are receptor tyrosine kinases. All of these will have ligands on the outside, and once they bound, once they bind the ligand, they will have a receptor tyrosine kinase. They will have tyrosine kinase activity on the inside. So, so insulin, we know it's a peptide hormone that's produced by the um, beta cells. Now, I can never know how to remember, the, how to pronounce this. Um, Langerhans, Lang, Lang, anybody knows how to pronounce this properly? Um, I guess this is after the scientists who discovered uh, these cells in the pancreas. Um, Langerans, anyway, uh, in the pancreas, and uh, so they produce insulin. They produce insulin, and insulin reaches the target cells, such as liver, muscles, or fat, via the bloodstream, right? And eventually, uh, once when insulin binds to, to its receptor, this initiates a cascade of events that leads to increased glucose uptake and metabolism. And so, the inner, and so if there is a problem with this pathway, that gives diabetes. Remember diabetes, there are two kinds, right? There's type one, which is uh, in childhood, the immune system of children will attack these cells in the pancreas and destroy them. And so these, obviously when these cells are defective or non-existent, they will never be able to produce insulin. And so, uh, so so uh, people with type 1 diabetes uh, constantly have to live by uh, constantly have to inject themselves with insulin after food intake. So, uh, but there is type 2. Type 2 is actually, uh, there's nothing wrong with the pancreas. Type 2 diabetes comes from the problems with insulin signaling in the cell. And that is actually a great area of research. So far, we haven't been able to really understand um, the pathology of type 2 diabetes. OK, so uh, in most cases, what happens with insulin receptor? So glucose, uh, uh, that actually um, re receptor will control how many of the glucose transporters are exposed to the outside world, right? So normally, so glucose transporters are stored within the cell membrane, within the cell actually, in these vesicles, right? So there's no point in resynthesizing and degrading insulin uh, glucose, glucose transporters. The cell simply stores them. So they are ready, they are ready when the, when the insulin comes and binds to the insulin receptor that initiates the um, tyrosine cascade. And the result of that is these vesicles, which have the glucose transporters sitting in them using their transmembrane domains, right? So they don't leave because their transmembrane domains are hydrophobic. And so these vesicles will fuse with the, with the cell membrane and become exposed to the outside world where they will allow for the glucose to come in into the cell, right? And so uh, they will be exposed on the cell membrane until they're no longer needed. And then again, the, uh, the cell membrane kind of invaginates like this, invaginates and, they, and buds off in, and, and a vesicle is produced, which 
travels back inside the cell and so all these small vesicles will then merge to form a larger what's called an endosome basically it's a large vesicle storing these glucose transporters and so they are ready to return to the surface when insulin levels rise again right so <clears throat> so this process happens all the time depending on our food intake right so uh, you um, you haven't eaten all your glucose transporters are sitting in this endosome you just ate there is uh, uh, glucose in the blood the pancreas start producing insulin insulin comes and binds to the receptor insulin receptor signaling results in the fusion of these endosomes with the cell membrane glucose is all allowed into the cell for example in the liver this will be in the liver cell uh, hepatocyte for example right that will um, produce glycogen produce glycogen and and the cycle repeats itself over and over depending on the food intake so uh, molecular detail of insulin receptor signaling is very um, very complex so here uh, as i mentioned to you there are alpha domains there are beta domains and so let's say the insulin the small molecule right there a little sphere right so insulin receptor binds insulin and undergoes autophosphorylation on its carboxyl terminal tyrosine residues. So in other words, this, so there are two parts, right? So it's a dimer. And so each part has a tyrosine kinase um, function, right? So each part is an enzyme and each part has tyrosine residues that can be phosphorylated. So, so this phosphorylates that and that phosphorylates this. So they each phosphorylate each other. And so you have a whole bunch of these phosphatyrosine residues on the um, uh, inner part of the insulin receptor. Now this, then um, once you have phosphatyrosine, this creates a binding site for what's known as IRS1. So this is insulin receptor one insulin receptor one irs1 irs1 recognizes these phosphatyrosines um, comes in binds to the insulin receptor insulin receptor sees another another prey and starts phosphorylating irs1 so then irs1 becomes phosphorylated by the insulin receptor and then leaves the membrane and is recognized by a another adaptive protein known as GRIB, GRIB2. GRIB2 binds to the phosphotyrosine, binds to the phosphotyrosine. Once that is bound, that produces conformational change, allows for SOS, another, now it's, I think it's abbreviated, it's, it stands for son of the seventh, something like that. There are all these uh, weird names. Uh, the sauce binds to it. Then RAS protein, which is actually linked to the cell membrane, um, which is a GTPase. So we talked about RAS a little bit. So that, that binds to sauce. Then RAF binds to RAS. RAF then is the, uh, is, it's a kinase. It will phosphorylate MEC. MEC comes in, becomes phosphorylated, and becomes activated. So it's phosphorylated on two serine residues. Then MEC will phosphorylate ERK. So ERK now in the phosphorylated form crosses the nuclear membrane and binds to and activates uh, nuclear transcription factors. So these are transcription factors which then um, 
uh, initiate basically in stimulate transcription of DNA and uh, translate a set of genes needed, for example, for cell for cell division or for um, set of genes which are required for control of uh, um, glucose absorption, for example, or any other function. So uh, depending on the cell type, right? So these transcription factors will vary depending on what kind of cell you're dealing with. All right, so uh, obviously now I don't want you to memorize all of these, but um, I want you to memorize um, the complexity of this. Just keep in mind how complex the system is, right? And how many branches can actually occur, right? So this is just one chain, but at each point there is some kind of branching which can lead to a different, which can lead to a different um, outcome. All right, ERK, okay, let me. Now this crosstalk, you can look at this. Uh, there is more, um, just showing that uh, insulin receptor can also facilitate many different, it can also work, can also act on adrenergic receptor. And in general, it actually, um, leads to adrenergic receptor internalization, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you think about, if there's a lot of insulin in the blood, that actually reduces fight or flight response, right? Just think about it. So for fight or flight response, you need glucose, right? And if insulin is produced, that means there is no fight or flight response. That means you don't need adrenergic receptor. So the so, so adrenergic receptor will become internalized. So that's one of the functions of insulin is to stop the fight or flight response. So there's GPCR, this is, okay. Anyway, so it will do, it will, it will act on multiple receptors and eventually it will lead to integration, right? The signals from different receptors will be added up and one final response will ensue. What I wanna show you, there's a couple other things I wanna mention. So these phosphorylated tyrosine residues are bound to proteins that have SH2 domains, right? So they're specific. So the proteins which binds phosphotyrosines, they're not all different. Uh, they have some specific domains known as, as SH2 domains, which binds phosphotyrosines. And for example, here, so this is the um, this will be the SH2 domain here that binds phosphotyrosine. What I do want to talk in the remaining time is about ion transport across cell membranes. So uh, in general, uh, the, uh, the membrane is polarized, right? Membranes are electrically polarized. And the reason why they polarized is because of the sodium potassium ATPase, which pumps three sodium out and two potassium in. And so obviously if you pump more positive ions out and bring in uh, fewer positively charged ions in, then on the outside, you'll have a positive charge. On the inside, you'll have a negative charge. So shown here, so uh, this is ATPase, right? So ATP energy is utilized to pump three sodiums out and bring two potassiums in. And so on the outside, the cell will be positively charged. On the inside, the cell will be negatively charged. And uh, so that trans transmembrane potential is used for variety of uh, functions in the body. And one of them is, for example, for the propagation of the nerve in nerve signaling. All right, so, um, so nerve signals propagate as electrical impulses. And the impulse involves opening of the voltage gated sodium channels. Okay, so let's look at that. So uh, for the remaining amount of time, we're going to look carefully at this particular picture of the nerve nerve signaling. 
So this will be the pre presynaptic neuron on top. Then we'll have a synapse, synaptic cleft in the blue. And then we have a postsynaptic neuron. Okay. So, so the, uh, the signal that is arriving uh, along this axon of the presynaptic neuron. So you can see here, um, the signal itself uh, involves depolarization of the cell membrane. So in other words, this voltage gated sodium ion channels will open will open, allowing for sodium to come inside. As sodium comes inside, you can see that uh, the plus that originally was on the membrane becomes minus, right? Because the positively charged ions are coming inside, coming inside. And so, uh, so that leads to depolarization of the cell membrane. On the other hand, and the sodium comes in, because obviously the sodium potassium ATPase pumps sodium I out. So the concentration of sodium inside the neuron is very low. And that's what drives the sodium in. And because sodium brings the positive charge, that leads to depolarization. Now, at the same time as that occurs, uh, there are these voltage gated potassium channels. Now remember the concentration of potassium inside the cell is higher than it is on the outside of the cell. We just saw that here, right? We just saw that here, the potassium is brought in, right? And sodium is taken out. And so potassium channels open, allowing for the sodium to get out. So the potassium to get out. And that will result in a repolarization in the membrane. So that it's very quick. So the, that's why the uh, nerve uh, signaling is um, is a fast way for transduction of multiple uh, nerve signals due to the, this very quick sequence of, of events, right? So depolarization will immediately be followed by a repolarization as the as the potassium ions leave. All right. So uh, then let's get back to our sodium. So once it reaches the um, the synaptic, synaptic cleft. Now, so here we have vesicles, vesicles with acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter, right? And as the repolarization reaches this area where we have lots of voltage gated calcium channels, so those will open. And remember, calcium concentration within the cell is kept low. And if calcium is allowed inside the cell, that usually leads to some kind of a signal. And so this calcium comes in, calcium comes in and uh, forces these vesicles to merge with the cell membrane in the synaptic cleft. In the synaptic cleft, now acetylcholine will be released in the, into the synaptic cleft and acetylcholine will interact with the ligand gated ion channels, right? So these ion channels, which are non-selective ion channels, allowing for sodium and calcium to get inside the postsynaptic neuron. And then sodium will again uh, lead to depolarization of the cell membrane and the action potential will continue to propagate now in the postsynaptic neuron which will also be followed by repolarization through the potassium. Okay. So, uh, uh, so what do we hear? What do we see here? So the nerve signaling involves voltage gated ion channels and it also involves ligand gated ion channels. Right. And so it's based on a, based on a, um, um, based on the function of sodium potassium ATPase, 
which creates the membrane potential. So depolar depolarization, repolarization, cross the synaptic cleft, again, depolarization, repolarization, and so on and so forth. Any questions? Yeah, you, you said voltage-gated uh, sodium channels and uh, what you call these ones again, just normal ion channels? So voltage-gated so voltage are the sodium channel which are responsible for the propagation of the action potential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were asking? Oh, no, I was asking what you called the uh, sodium-calcium channel right here. Oh, so these are ligand-gated. Ligand-gated, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah, these are ligand-gated. And so this ligand, uh, basically, uh, you can you, do you know of any other neurotransmitters? So now you know in the brain, acetylcholine, uh, ac actually acetylcholine is, is not only responsible for the nerve to nerve signaling, neuron to neuron, it's, it can, it's also present in neuron, in neuromuscular junction, right? So, so for example, this can be a neuron, right on top, and on the bottom, this can be a muscle cell. So um, do you know of any other neurotransmitters? Uh, serotonin. Serotonin, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one, for example, is uh, GABA, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. That's another good one. Um, which is the one that, uh, uh, that, um, that people have a shortage of those who suffer from Parkinson's? Dopamine. Dopamine, yeah. So uh, depending on the, um, on the particular type of uh, nerve signaling, you can have different kinds of neurotransmitters, but each of them will, will control some kind of ion channel. Each of them will be ligand, will, will act on ligand gated ion channels. And so using, I guess, the nerve system utilizes different neurotransmitters to transmit different signals, basically just to, um, to control which nerve impulses are being transmitted in the brain and which are, which are shut down, which are allowed to, to which are allowed to, um, uh, to happen and which ones are not. All right, so for integrin, we don't need to, really need to worry about that. And the last thing here is the uh, hormones. Uh, so kind, kind of already mentioned that to you. So basically hormone, uh, you, in many cases, this will be some kind of sterile der derivative, some kind of um, sterile produced from cholesterol. And you can see here, there is a, a hormone responsive element and um, so there'll be a receptor. So, hor so, hor so this hormone is gonna be hydrophobic. It can cross the, the plasma membrane. It can cross the nuclear membrane and it will bind to a specific receptor in the nucleus. And once it's bound to its receptor, now once it's bound to its receptor, Now I'm just trying to figure out. So this is DNA polymerase. So this will be the receptor, right? So this is the receptor shown here. This is the hormone receptor, right? So this is the hormone and it will go into this pocket, into this pocket. And so now it's sitting in the pocket and it will interact with the obviously piece of DNA which is going to be ex, um, transcribed. And this one is um, RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, which will create the messenger RNA, which will go towards the ribosome and result in the production of the protein. So, all right.
So for the summary, so what we learned, we learned different types of receptors, cell signaling, uh, that senses extracellular environment specific to ligands, amplifies the signal, can be modular, uh, desensitize to prevent this. So we learned about all these is issues of signal trans transduction from the outside to inside. We talked a lot about GPCRs, it's the main mechanism, remember, for signal transduction. Uh, we talked about receptor tyrosine kinases, probably the second main mechanism. Uh, we talked about receptor guanine cyclases, right, which produce the second messenger, cyclic GMP. And we talked about voltage gated ion channels to generate propagate nerve impulses. And the regulation, dysregulation of intracellular signaling cascades can lead to cancer. So specifically, uh, so each of these players, just to go back to something like this, right? You can imagine each of these players uh, has to be tightly controlled by the whole sequence of events. But now imagine that one of these, for example, for example, the um, protein RAF, kinase RAF, is only activated by RAS, right? But now imagine that uh, there's a mutation in the RAF that, is, is, that occurs on a site which is responsible for the activation by RAS. And the mutation leads to, const, to, to uh, permanently active RAF. So in other words, RAS does not control RAF anymore. So RAF is, on, is totally on its own, is constantly on, and so will continuously phosphorylate this protein MEC. Phosphorylate, 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 phosphorylate. So RAS is telling it, RAS is telling it, stop, stop, stop. But RAF will tell him, will say, no, I'm not gonna stop because I'm mutated. I'm not, I'm not feeling the signal from you. And I'm just gonna continue phosphorylate MEC. And that eventually will uh, continue to produce, uh, to trans transcribe genes, which are responsible for cell division and the cell will continuously divide because, uh, because the breaks have been taken off, right? Okay, any questions? Any questions? No? All right, so uh, good luck on the test on Wednesday. Now let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you again on Friday for the final review session. Bye guys. Thank you.